Hello, and welcome to part four of my NES emulator series. If you've not seen the other parts, I suggest that you do so before watching this one. And I just want to fit in a small disclaimer before I start. Uh, at no point do I claim that this emulator is 100% faithful to the original hardware, it is likely not cycle accurate, and it probably isn't compatible with all of the NES games out there. But that's not the point. What I'm trying to do with this series is explain an approach to emulating a system. And it just so happens I've chosen a system which means a lot to me. This video is the first of two videos describing the Picture Processing Unit, or the PPU. And this is a device on the NES's main hardware that is responsible for producing the images we see on the screen. Specifically in this video we're going to look at how the NES stores and renders its graphics when it's producing the images we see in the background. And if you would indulge me for a moment, I'd like to thank all of my Patreons and YouTube channel members for their support. You may recall from the previous video that the PPU has access to three memories on its address bus. An 8 kilobyte pattern memory, or character ROM, and I'm going to assume it's a ROM. It can be a RAM, but for this I'm going to assume it's a ROM. A 2 kilobyte name table memory, which is mirrored through this address range. And you'll hear me refer to this as VRAM occasionally. The configuration of this specific memory is non-trivial and we'll look at that in detail. And a small memory that holds the palette information. This is used to decide which colours are displayed on the screen. Broadly speaking, the pattern memory contains the sprites. What things look like. And these are stored as bitmapped images. The name table describes the layout of the background. And the palette memory contains the colours. This video is going to specifically focus on rendering the backgrounds of the games. So even though this memory handles sprites, don't assume it is exclusively for sprites. It just really contains the graphical information that all parts of the PPU require to draw things on the screen. The 8 kilobyte pattern memory can be broadly split into two 4 kilobyte sections. And each one of these sections is split into a 16 by 16 grid of sprites. A sprite can also be referred to as a tile, and the tile itself is 8 by 8 pixels. Meaning that if we viewed this as an image, it would be 128 pixels wide by 128 pixels tall. The PPU has the ability to select between the left hand side of this memory or the right hand side of this memory to act as the source for its drawing. Assuming the pattern memory lies solely on the cartridge, we have to go via the mapper to access it. And so the mapper has the ability to selectively swap out sections giving access to different sprites. And in fact, this is how many sprites are animated on the NES. 8 by 8 pixels per tile doesn't seem like very much. So the sprites that we see in the game or the background elements usually consist of multiple tiles. And it's quite common to see this memory split that one half handles sprites, the characters that jump about and move around on the screen, and the other half handles background tiles. So these may make up things like the scenery in the game. Never underestimate just how creative an artist can be with such a limited number of tiles to choose from. Famously in Super Mario Bros., the clouds are the same as the bushes. They're just a different colour, so the tiles can be reused. The tile is an 8x8 bitmap, but it's not like the bitmaps you've seen in Windows Paint. The NES only uses two bits per pixel, so that gives you a choice of four colours per pixel. And it stores the tile in the following and quite convenient way. Since we've only got four colours, our pixels can assume the values 0, 1, 2 or 3. And the information for a tile is stored in two bit planes. So I'm just going to denote this one as being the least significant bit plane and this one as the most significant bit plane. The value of a specific pixel is the sum of the two bits from the respective locations in the bit planes. So that zero value would have zero in those locations. The pixel with a value one has a one here, but a zero here. The value two has a zero in the least significant and one in the most significant. And of course, three has a one in both locations. For reasons which will become more apparent a little later, Pixel values of zero can be considered transparent. Storing in bit planes like this is quite convenient. It means we don't have to do lots of shifting and bitwise manipulation to extract the data. 
because as you may have noticed, we've got eight bits going across like this, a single byte, and the tile in memory is stored as the entire least significant bit plane, followed by the entire most significant bit plane, implying that it takes 16 bytes to store an entire tile. I probably should have drawn those in hex. And so going back to our pattern memory, once we've identified where the tile offset is in that memory of the tile that we're interested in, we can just read the next 16 bytes to get the entire tile out of that memory. The two bits of the tile is not enough to specify its colour. We need to combine it with a palette. The palette memory is structured in the following way. At address 3F00, we have a single entry for the background colour. And this is going to be an 8-bit value that indexes specifically one of the colours the NES is capable of displaying. And I'm showing here the NES palette generated by Bisquith. And so if I wanted the background colour to say be cyan, then looking at the palette table, I can choose the appropriate colour. In this case, it's a 0x2c. Whereas 3f00 stores one byte, the other entries in this memory map store four bytes. Even though there are four possible entries, the fourth byte isn't used. But let's try and understand why. If we index our palettes, 0, 1 through 7. We can combine our chosen palette ID with our 2-bit pixel value to select the appropriate memory location that contains the colour that we want. Let's assume the palette's ID is 1 and the pixel value is 3. We know that each palette entry consists of 4 bytes, so we'll multiply the palette ID by 4 and we'll add to that the pixel value. Knowing that our palette memory starts at 3F00, we can index from that address. So here we would have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, which gives us entry 3 for palette 1, which is what's specified by the pixel and palette ID. Curiously, if the pixel value was 0, our total offset would have been 4, 0, 1, 2, 3. 4, and that takes us to our unused location. 0 means that pixel should be transparent, i.e. the background colour should show through. And so before when I said this particular palette index was unused, that's a little misleading. In fact, it mirrors the background colour address, as do all of the fourth entries for each palette. This clever architecture means that no matter what palette you have selected, for your particular drawing, you get an effective bonus colour from the background, which can make the item that you're drawing look transparent. Even though this is quite obvious for sprites, it also applies to background tiles too. And I think this whole assembly is a wonderful example of the designers really thinking about the most optimal memory strategies and require the most minimum computation in order to compute the final output colour for a given pixel depending on whether or not it can be seen. One final partitioning of this memory is that these four entries are used for background palettes and these four entries are used for foreground palettes or sprites. You'll hear me use the term foreground or sprites interchangeably. So I think it'll be quite fun to visualize the pattern memory for different games. I'm going to start off with the code just as we left it in the last episode. But because there's a lot to get through in this video, I'm not going to go through the code byte by byte. As I did with the CPU video, I've provided an accompanying source file that goes into some detail explaining every facet of the PPU at this stage. And so you may find this very useful to consult whilst watching this video. We finished the previous video with a rudimentary skeleton of the PPU. It didn't do anything except artificially generate some noise but it was connected to the CPU bus and the cartridge appropriately via mapper 0. We'd already filled in an array of all of the available colours the NES is capable of displaying, and we created two sprites in an array called SPR Pattern Table, which we'll use to visualise the pattern memory. So let's implement this function, because I think by doing this we'll gain a real understanding of how palettes and the bitmaps work together. We know that for a given pattern table, there are 16 by 16 tiles. So I'm going to create two nested for loops to iterate through these. 
I want to convert my 2D coordinate into a 1D coordinate to index the pattern memory. Now we've used y times width plus x many many times and I mention it in many many videos, but this one's slightly different. Here we've got the y, but the width is 256. And that's because, don't forget, a single tile consists of 16 bytes of information, and we've got 16 of them in a single row in the sprite memory. So this offset will be the byte offset in that memory. For each tile, we've got 8 rows of 8 pixels. And so just for completion, I'll add in the 8 columns here. In order to read from the pattern memory, we need to use our PPU read function. So this will place an address on the PPU's address bus and get the data from wherever it needs to come from. Hopefully the mapper will sort out that translation for us. And calculating the address is quite easy. We know we've got two pattern tables to choose from, and we pass in index i depending on which one we're trying to get the sprite for. And we also know that a full pattern table is 4 kilobytes, and into that 4 kilobytes we want to offset by the offset we've just calculated. We know that for each tile, a single row of pixels is one byte, so I'm also going to offset by that. And since we know that we're going to read from the least significant bit plane before the most significant bit plane, I'm just going to, for visual reasons, put an add zero here. And that's because the corresponding most significant bit is exactly the same, but offset by an additional eight. Together, this little routine gives me two bytes, each containing 8 pixels worth of data, and we need to combine these bytes to give us our final bitmap colour, between 0 and 3. I'm going to combine these bytes by adding them, but I'm only interested in adding the least significant bit of each byte, because that will give me a value between 0 and 3. And this means the next time in this loop we get to this calculation, we need all of our bits to have shifted 1, so that next time the next bit is the least significant bit. Now we have a pixel value, we can start to draw that value into the sprite that represents this section of the pattern memory. The x coordinate of this specific tile is the tile's offset x location in pixel space, but I'm doing this plus 7 minus column because the least significant bit of our tile word refers to the rightmost pixel in the tile but we're drawing from the top left of the tile first, so we just need to invert it on the x-axis. The y-axis is much simpler, and finally we need to choose the colour, but we've not used a palette yet, all we've got is the pixels 2-bit value. So I'm going to create a function called getColorFromPaletRAM, which is going to take in a palette ID and the pixel value to determine the final screen colour. This means I need to add a palette value as one of the arguments to this function. So let's add this get color from palette RAM function. If you remember, we need to take the palette ID and multiply it by 4. And to that, we add the pixel ID. This whole value is then offset into the palette memory. And so we need to perform a PPU read of this location to access that memory. The value that's returned from this read is an index into the NES's colour palette, which we've stored in PAL screen as an array, and so we can return the colour directly. The PPU read and PPU write functions are empty at the moment, they don't do anything. So let's add in the three main memories. We know that we can defer to the mapper on the cartridge to handle relocations of the requested addresses. The pattern memory sat between 0 and 1FFF, and the name table memory sat between 2000 and 3 EFF. And finally the palette memory sat right at the end. What we have for reads, we also have for writes. In our PPU class we had added these memories as arrays, name table, palettes and patterns. For the table palette array we can select the appropriate index by masking the bottom five bits. And I'll also hard code in the mirroring. Finally all that's left to do is to read directly from that memory location. And naturally, we'll do something very similar for write. Since we want to visualise the pattern memory, it would be useful to be able to read from it. Well, that's quite simple in this range. Here is the pattern memory array, and the first dimension chooses whether it's the left or the right-hand side of that array of data by examining the most significant bit of the PPU address. The offset into that memory 
is calculated by masking the remaining bits of the PPU address. Pattern memory is usually a ROM, but just in case, I'm also going to add in for PPU write, because on some cartridges, this memory is in fact a RAM. Let's go back to the main application now. This is the Pixel Game Engine derivative which we're using to visualize and interact with the emulator. To this class, I'm going to add an additional variable called selected palette because I'm going to allow the user to choose which palette is being used to draw the pattern tables, which they can do by pressing the P key. It just increments this value and wraps it around. Drawing the pattern tables is now quite simple. We just draw the sprite and we call the PPU function get pattern table to render the pattern table instantaneously for us. And we want to look at both of them, so I pass on the index 0 or 1 and I pass on the current palette I wish to view them in. And in fact, whilst I'm here, and I'm not going to go into detail on this, I'm going to draw the palettes as well and draw which one of them is selected. Don't worry about this, it's unrelated to the emulation, it's purely cosmetics for the user interface. So let's take a look. Well, right now we can see we've now got two grey rectangles in the bottom corner that are going to represent our pattern memories. And if I press the P key, I'm scrolling between the eight visible palettes. But everything's grey and boring. And that's simply because the program hasn't run yet, so it's not actually established what the palette should be. Even after running for a little while, we'll see there's still no visible information here. What's going on? Well, if I step through the program, we can see it doesn't get very far. The program is attempting to load from 2002 on the CPU address bus, and it's not getting the value it's looking for, so it's stuck in this loop. Well, 2002 and in fact 2000 to 2007 are important registers. They're the ones that control the PPU and reveal its status to the CPU. Before we can go any further, we need to look at those. The CPU talks to the PPU via eight registers. It's actually nine, but we'll look at the ninth in the next episode. And in the CPU address bus, these exist from 2000 to 2007, although they are mirrored over quite a large address range. 2000 is the control register. This is responsible for configuring the PPU to render in different ways. At 2001, we have the mask register. This decides whether backgrounds or sprites are being drawn and what's happening at the edges of the screen. For 2002, a very important one, is the status register. And for this video, that's going to be important for telling us when it's safe to render. The next two registers I'm going to leave out for this video. At 2005, we have the scroll register. It is through this register that we can represent game worlds far larger than what we can see on the screen. As Mario runs to the right towards the flag, the level is effectively scrolling to the left. Finally, we have two registers in 2006 and 2007 that allow the CPU to directly read and write to the PPU's memory, address and data. The full addressable range of the PPU is 14 bits, but the CPU can only transfer 8 bits during a write. So it has to do two successive writes to set the address. The first 8 bits set the low byte of the address and the second 8 bits set the high byte. The actual data to transfer is of course written and read through the data register. To the PPU header file, I'm going to add some structures that consist of bit fields to represent the important registers. Here is the status register. It has three bits that are important, one for vertical blank, one for sprite zero, and another for sprite overflow. I've unioned them with an 8-bit register so we can access it numerically. Refer to the first episode of this series to understand how this structure works. The mask register is really just a series of switches that determine which parts of the PPU are switched on or off. And so we can see the important ones rendering sprites and rendering background. And finally, we have the control register. I fully appreciate that that's a huge dump of new stuff to take in, but it's my intention to explain it as we go along. The test program I ran before got stuck because it was reading from the status register. In particular, it was looking for the status of vertical blank. Let's take a moment to understand the order of events that occur whilst rendering a frame. In the last video, I equated two rather strange variables, scanline and cycles, 
to be the equivalent of y and x values on our screen. There is certainly a relationship, but it's not one to one. Scan lines represent the horizontal rows across the screen. Back in the days when the electron gun was firing at the phosphorescent material at the front of the screen. The NES resolution is effectively 256 pixels across by 240 pixels down. However, the scan line can exceed these dimensions. As the scan line is going across, it's counting cycles. And we crudely estimated that one cycle was the equivalent of one pixel along the scan line. Since the scan line goes beyond the edge of the screen, so does the cycle count. And in fact, there are 341 cycles per scan line. This is approximate. If you really read into the NESDEV documentation, you'll see that some of these numbers are rounded slightly. Once it gets to the end of the scan line, the gun would switch off and go back to the next one. And it would keep doing this all the way down the screen through the visible area, so 240 visible scan lines. But it doesn't stop when it gets to the bottom. In fact, there are quite a few more scan lines off the bottom of the screen. In total, there are 261 scan lines. This period of unseen scan lines is known as the vertical blanking period. And it's important that the game knows when this period starts. If, whilst the scan line is being drawn across the screen and the CPU starts to talk to the PPU, it could inadvertently cause all sorts of graphical artifacts on the screen. In some advanced scenarios, this is in fact exploited. But for our simple use case, it would generate noise. It just wouldn't look very nice. And so it's important that the CPU knows it can do some processing whilst the screen is updating, but it can't really change the nature of the PPU. Once the vertical blank period has started, however, of course the CPU can change the nature of the PPU. We can't see what it does. It's free to make the output as messy as it likes. So it is typically during this period that the CPU is setting up the PPU ready for the next frame. For our emulation purposes, we're going to assume that once we've got to the last scan line, we don't jump back to scan line zero. Instead, we put in a conceptual scan line minus one. And we'll see more about that when we start rendering the background tiles a little later. And so the vertical blank bit in our status word tells us whether we're in screen space or nothingness space. We can mess things up. We can also optionally emit an interrupt request to the CPU at this point too. This uses the non-maskable interrupt feature of the 6502. Whether or not we emit this interrupt is governed by a bit of the control word on the PPU register. Combinations of the vertical blank bit and the non-maskable interrupt are used for synchronizing the PPU with the CPU so things on the screen look normal. It's important that the CPU finish doing whatever it's doing whilst the screen is being rendered, or else we'll get lag. And the CPU may have to wait an entire frame before the screen is updated. You saw this a lot on NES games when things got busy on the screen. And for exactly the same reasons, you see it in modern games too. In the previous video, we'd already left in placeholders for these registers. It's time to start filling some of these in. So let's start with the control word for write. Simply, we assign our control status word to the data being written. And because it's convenient to do so, I can do the same for our mask register. You can't write to the status register, and I'm ignoring these two for this video. We'll also come back to scroll a little later too. To handle the address and data transfers, I'm going to need a few variables. I need to know whether I'm writing to the low byte or high byte. So I'll create a variable called address latch, which indicates which. When we read data from the PPU, it is in fact delayed by one cycle. And so we need to buffer that byte. I'll also add a 16-bit variable to store the compiled address. So if we're writing to the address register and latch is equal to zero, I'm going to store the lower eight bits of the new PPU address and set my address latch to one which primes it for the next write to the address where I'm going to store the high byte. Once I have the full address, I can write data. 
using my PPU write function. In the CPU read implementation, you can't read from the address register, doesn't make any sense. But we can read from the data register, but it's delayed by one read. So I'm going to take the current contents of my buffer and transfer that to the output data and read into the buffer the value of the address. And here is where we get into one of our first of many quirks of emulation. This delayed read is true for almost all of the PPU address range, except for where our palettes reside. There are various hardware reasons why this could be the case. At the moment, everything is synchronous to the PPU's instruction clock. And so before a memory can output a value, it needs to be primed with an address. These all take clock cycles. This is why you get a delay. However, there are certain types of small memories available which don't need this delay. They work using combinatorial logic and can output data within the same clock cycle. It takes a little bit of time, but normally you would ensure as the designer that the propagation time through that circuit yields correct results within the clock cycle. And in this case, I feel that the pallet memory is stored exactly this way. So we need to put in a special case just for handling pallet addresses. And so in this case, I don't want to wait another clock cycle to get the data in the buffer. I know some of you will be thinking ahead and realize that, hang on, none of this can possibly work in an actual emulation. And you're quite right, but we'll come back to that when we start implementing the background scrolling. The only other register we're interested in reading from right now is the status register. And reading from the status register also does certain things to the PPU. That's quite an unusual concept to get your head around. Just the act of reading is changing the state of the device. When we read from the status register, we're only interested in the top three bits. The unused bits tend to be filled with noise, or more likely, what was last on the internal data buffer of the PPU. I don't think any legitimate NES games rely on this behaviour, but it is isolated in NES Dev as being factual, so I've included it here. Although you could probably get away by not having this part at all. Interestingly, reading from the status register also clears the vertical blank flag. So whether or not you are in vertical blank is irrelevant. As soon as you read the status to determine if you're in vertical blank, it gets reset to zero. As well as setting the vertical blank flag, reading from the status register will also set our address latch back to zero. And just a minute, this is making me think of something we've just done incorrectly. At the moment, when we're writing to the address port, I'm setting the low byte and then the high byte. This is wrong, I've made a mistake. We need to set the high byte and then the low byte. So I'm going to swap these round. Apologies for that. We know that our program was getting stuck reading the status register. So I'm going to hack in something just to make some progress. I'm going to set it that it always returns a one for the vertical blank bit when it reads this register. This is to get it past the part of the program where it's getting stuck. So let's take a look. I'll run the program and great. I'll just pause that. Uh, what we can see now is we're getting some sprite information in our pattern tables, but it looks a little off to me. This is the NES test ROM, and I know that this doesn't look like this. It's not these colors. The palettes aren't quite correct. And we can see that it's not really made any effort to try and set the palettes to something useful. We're missing a fairly important part of what happens when the CPU writes data to the PPU. It would be very tedious for the programmer to have to write two bytes of address and then one byte of data. Most of the time, programmers will be writing data to successive locations. And so the PPU provides a facility for this. It has an auto increment on the PPU address when written to and when read from. So let's try it again. That's better. We can see a full range of colours now for the palettes, and as I press the P key, I can scroll through the palettes and see how the pattern table looks with a particular palette applied. For the purposes of demonstration, I have significantly simplified this part of the emulation. We'll see in the second part of this video how this can become a lot more complex to handle choosing of tiles depending upon the location of the scan line. We're now going to get into the serious side of rendering the background.
But before we can do that, let's add in the timing to emit the non-maskable interrupt at the end of a frame. We know the precise location when we enter vertical blank when our scan line is 241 and our cycle is at the beginning. So at this specific time, I'm going to set the vertical blank bit to 1. If the enable non-maskable interrupt bit has been set in the control register, then I'm going to set a non-maskable interrupt variable to true. And this is a boolean that I've included in the header file. We need to get the fact that the interrupt has been emitted from the PPU to the CPU. And I'm going to do that in the bus. And this is very simple. If it's true, then I'm going to call the NMI function on the CPU. And I'll also reset the NMI flag on the PPU. We know when we leave the vertical blanking period because we're effectively at the top left of the screen. So I'm going to set my vertical blank bit to zero. So now the status word accurately reflects the state of the vertical blank period. And we optionally have control of emitting the non-maskable interrupt. This means I can get rid of my little hack to make things work. I thought at this point it might be interesting just to see if any other games are capable of displaying their pattern memories. Here we can see the pattern memory for Super Mario Brothers, and you can just about make out the sprites that comprise of a certain Italian plumber. This is definitely not Jario. And on the left we can see it is the sprites of the characters, and on the right we can see it is tiles that make up the background scenery. And as I change the palettes, we can see how the colours change too. Let's try another one. Here we can see, again, we've got background tiles and sprites, and they've changed colour on their own. That's not me changing the palette. The program itself has changed the palette. This is encouraging stuff. So let's just have a quick little recap of where we're up to, because it's going to get complicated. We have some fixed memories for the name table, the palette, and the pattern memory. And we've created three registers. The status register tells us where we're up to in our rendering process. The mask register we've not really looked at yet. And the control register, really all we've used so far is this enable NMI pin to emit the correct interrupt. Temporarily, I've created this register called PPU address so we can visualize the pattern memories as the program is executing. In reality, this is a dramatic oversimplification of how this address works, and that's what we'll look at next. Now that we've examined how graphical information is stored on the NES, we can get to the real heart of this video and look at how the backgrounds are stored and subsequently rendered. Backgrounds in NES games usually make up the level scenery, and are more or less static compared to the objects in the foreground known as sprites. The background of the game is stored in a name table in the name table memory, and here I have a name table. It's one kilobyte in size, so it's 32 entries across, by 32 entries down. Each entry is a single byte, and that byte represents an ID into the pattern memory we saw earlier. If you recall, the pattern memory is a 16 by 16 grid of 8 by 8 tiles. So quite conveniently, there are 256 possible tiles to place in a single name table location. Since each tile is 8 by 8 pixels, we can now see where the Nintendo is getting its resolution from. 32 times 8 is 256 pixels across, and 32 by 8 is 256 pixels down. But it's not. The Nintendo vertical resolution is in fact 240, which means not all of the rows of the name table are used. In fact, these bottom two rows of the name table are used for something else, which we'll look at later. When crafting a level, the game designer carefully chooses the tiles they need and the locations they need to be placed within. And sometimes the background even contains elements you might think are foreground. In its most simple form, a single name table like this represents a whole visible screen. And this is just fine for some of the earlier Nintendo games like Donkey Kong. Slightly more sophisticated games like Mario required the screen to scroll left or right. And we can write how many tiles are offset from the top left into the scroll register of the PPU. But we've got a problem. We've clearly run out of name table here. To facilitate scrolling, the NES actually stores two name tables, and they lie next to each other in the memory. As the viewable area of the screen scrolls across, 
it crosses this boundary and we render from two different name tables simultaneously. The CPU is tasked with updating the invisible parts of the name table with the bits of level that are going to be seen next. When the viewable window scrolls past the end of the second name table, it effectively wraps back round into the first one, and this allows you to have a continuous scrolling motion in two directions. The NES itself has memory for just two name tables, so that's two kilobytes of video RAM. But by utilising address mirroring, we can conceptually have four name tables. There's still only two kilobytes to store the data, so two of these name tables are simply duplicates of the other two. This duplication is also rather confusingly called mirroring. In this configuration, this is called horizontal mirroring, because our actual memory contains these two name tables, but the ones to the side of them are the mirrors. So if I write to this location here, I'm also writing to this location here. In Mario, the screen scrolls horizontally, but some games it only scrolls vertically. And so in games that scroll vertically between the name tables, we're using horizontal mirroring. Games like Super Mario Bros. use vertical mirroring, where the 2 kilobyte memory stores these name tables, and the ones underneath are the mirrors. In this case, writing to this location is exactly the same as writing to this location. The configuration of the name table mirroring can come from a variety of sources. On some cartridges, like Super Mario Bros., it's hard-coded into the cartridge circuit, and that means the entirety of Super Mario Bros. is limited to scrolling horizontally. Some mapping circuits can also dictate how mirroring is implemented, and can dynamically switch between the two depending on what's required. Admittedly, this is on slightly more advanced games. In games like Zelda, you see scrolling occurring in both directions. In more advanced games like Super Mario Bros. 3, you can see scrolling in both directions simultaneously. But the core concept to understand here is that as you're scrolling in a particular direction, the CPU must be updating the name table with the background that's about to appear. We can specify a particular tile offset using the scroll register. And as we've done many times in this video, it's not dissimilar to y times width plus x. But if width is a power of 2, we can take advantage of binary numbers to perform this calculation for us just by existing. Here we know we've got 32 by 32 tiles. That requires 5 bits per tile offset. I'm going to call these offsets course y and course x. Both of these are 5 bit words. By simply concatenating them to form a 10 bit word, we have actually implemented this equation. Because in binary, if we split the word at some point, the number on this side is a count of how many times this side occurs. And so if it's a power of 2 boundary, in this case it's 32, this side is automatically multiplied by 32 plus whatever this value is. Since we've got four possible name tables that we can address, we're going to need an additional two bits. And excuse me for just reusing the same grid pattern here. And so using exactly the same logic as before, I'm going to extend our 10-bit address to a 12-bit address, name table X and name table Y. Four name tables gives us 4,096 possible locations, which very conveniently is the maximum number we can represent with a 12-bit address. If our game only scrolled in whole tiles, it would look quite blocky and jumpy, and the NES doesn't look blocky and jumpy, it can scroll quite smoothly. Because each cell is 8x8 eight eight pixels, we also need to store offsets into a single cell. And so I'm going to introduce another two variables, fine y and fine x. Note that these are not part of this 12-bit address. As the scan line is zipping across the screen, we count cycles to work out which particular tile the scan line is currently residing within. Each cycle of the scan line is the equivalent of a single pixel being drawn, and therefore for each cycle we can increment our fine x value. If the fine x value goes to greater than 7, we'll increment our coarse x value. In a similar way, each time we progress down the screen with new scan lines, we'll increment 
our fine y value. And again, if it goes greater than 7, we'll increment whatever is in course y. This doesn't change the number of bits, it was just a number I added 1 to. If we have scrolled the screen, as we're incrementing along the scan line counting cycles, at some point we'll cross into the next name table. If this happens, we can invert our name table bit. And likewise, as we're scrolling down the screen, we'll invert the name table Y bit. And even further, if we carry on scrolling in one of those directions and go beyond the second name table in that direction, we'll invert those bits again, which resets them back to normal and implements the wraparound functionality. We'll look at this form of addressing in a bit more detail in a few moments. But some of you may already be thinking, well, hang on, we know which tile we want to display from our pattern memory for a particular location on a name table, but we've not specified which palette. Recall that the bottom two rows of a name table are not visible on the screen. This is 64 bytes of what is called attribute memory. Each one of these bytes is responsible for a region of the name table. And since we've got 64 of them, it's fair to assume that we can divide the name table up into an 8x8 eight eight grid. One of the attribute bytes is responsible for a 4x4 four four cell region of tiles. These 16 tiles occupy quite a large area of the screen, so limiting that one area to a single palette is rather restrictive for the designer. Also, recall from the palette memory, there are only four palettes available to use in the background. So in principle, we only need two bits per palette. Since the attribute byte is eight bits, we can specify four distinct palettes in that word. And so we can reasonably assume we can break our four by four tiles into four lots of two by two tiles. And the NES does this, and it apportions bits 7 and 6 to being the bottom right, bits 5 and 4 to being the bottom left, bits 3 and 2 to being the top right, and bits 1 and 0 to being the top left. So all four of these tiles must share the same palette. And for a reference of scale, the question mark block in Super Mario Brothers is a 2x2 two two tile. And so not only do we have to work out where our scan line is after scrolling in the name table to get the tile ID, we can use the same information, albeit crushed down slightly by throwing some out and offsetting it to a different location, to choose the appropriate attribute byte for that region. And we can work this out by taking our composite address of course Y and course X and reducing the 5-bit implementations to 3. This is the same as dividing by 4. So our original 32 tiles on the name table have now been reduced to the eight regions of palette in the attribute memory. If we assume up here is address zero for our name table, then clearly whatever number we have got that represents our attribute memory offset, we need to offset to the start location of the attribute memory, which is 3C0. And we'll use the two bits that we've just thrown out here to help us choose which two bit section of the eight bit attribute memory word we're using for a given tile. Personally, I found this part of the NES emulation probably the most complicated part. And my very simplified description of it here is probably not doing it justice. So please do consult the source file because there's a lot of detail in the comments specifically about how this mechanism works. Before we start rendering the backgrounds, I think it might be useful to visualize a name table. But I'm not going to visualize it in graphical detail, because that would just be rendering the background. Instead, what I'm going to do is display the tile IDs, just to make sure that we've got all of the memory set up correctly. Here are our two one kilobyte name tables. And we've left space in our PPU read and PPU write functions to access the name table memory with the appropriate mirroring. But we need to know what the mirror mode currently is. But for the simple demonstration games I'm using, that information is contained in the cartridge. So looking at the structure that represented the header for the ROM, in a similar way to how we determined which mapper was being used, I can also extract how the cartridge is mirrored. And for now, I'm going to assume four very basic modes, horizontal and vertical, and a couple of others we'll worry about in the future. So I'm going to set up special conditions depending on the mirroring mode. There are some fancy bitwise mathematical ways to do this, but 
As I've described, I'm trying to keep this visually simple. If we're in vertical mirroring mode, then we look at the address offset to the start of the name table RAM and choose the appropriate physical name table depending on that address. For horizontal mirroring, it's quite the same, except the physical name tables are in a different order. And as always, what we do for read, we also do for write. Before we display the name table IDs, I'm just going to stop the emulator from outputting the noise. I think we're done with that now. Because I don't want to fully visualise the name table, I'm just going to draw the IDs in the corresponding name table location atop of whatever the screen is outputting. In this case, I've chosen name table 0, and I'm converting them to hex. I've uh, preloaded the nestest.nesrom, so let's take a look. So nothing's happened yet, the name table is all zero, so I'll run the, the emulation, and we can see the name table has changed, and it's got some structure to it. It's a little bit too difficult to interpret, perhaps. Let me just stop the emulation. So we see that the character 20 appears quite a lot in the environment. And because everything conveniently is in hex and our arrays of patterns are in 16 by 16 grid, we can easily work out which particular pattern tile the name table refers to. So for 20 that would be 0, 1, 2 down and 0 across, so that's empty space for the most part. Which is correct because the menu screen for the NES test ROM is mostly empty space with a list of text in between. A quick and crude way to visualize the name table could be to take this ID directly and then use the draw partial sprite function of the pixel game engine and the pattern table as a source sprite to draw that tile in the right place. You know what, I couldn't resist doing that, so I've just implemented that line of code and we'll take a look. So this is going to hopefully show the name table, but it's not rendered as the NES intended. But there we go, we actually see the uh, test menu for that particular ROM. Should be able to change the palette too. Yep. And because I'm getting all giddy and excited, I can't resist, I'm just going to try another game. Well, hmm. I don't think it's chosen the correct name table there. That looks like the one for the sprites. I'll just brute force swap that over for now. Well, again, it's kind of there, but not quite right. <laughs> Given at the moment the performance is atrocious, I was quite pleased to see this screen pop up automatically. Let's just see if we can repair some of those glitches, because I think I know what's causing them. Name tables are fundamentally updated by the CPU writing to the PPU. To increase the efficiency of this process, the PPU address automatically incremented, so you could just continuously write a stream of data. However, just incrementing by one will only increment the address in a horizontal direction across the screen. What if you wanted to write to the name table, but in a vertical orientation? Well, this is exactly what the NES is designed to do. The control register has a specific bit that can be set by the program, called increment mode. And this decides whether the increment should be a 1 or a 32. If it's a 1, we're incrementing along the x-axis. But if it's 32, we're skipping 32 tiles at a time along in the x-axis, which is the same as going down one row in the y-axis. Now that the CPU can control the direction of this increment, let's see if that's repaired our glitches. Oh, very nice. It has. The screen looks far more sensible now. The reason the performance sucked is because I was generating the pattern tables for every single tile. So I quickly hack this together. I know I'm shooting off on a tangent. I'm just excited. But let's have a look at how Donkey Kong renders now. So it's rendering much, much faster than it was before. And here we can see the uh, uncorrupted Donkey Kong level. Oh, we can see Donkey Kong himself uh, being animated. Let's see if we can choose a... That looks like a Donkey Kong palette, doesn't it? Maybe? That one, perhaps. So that's very pleasing to see. So even though it looks like we've rendered the background, we haven't at all. It's a complete hack. And so what we'll do now is implement the background rendering properly. So we don't get confused, I'm going to comment out my hack. I'll keep it around just in case it helps us out with some debugging later. Rendering to the screen requires counting scan lines and cycles. I think we've established that. But one of the most useful diagrams you'll find on the NESDEV wiki is this frame timing diagram. What this diagram shows are the cycles going across the screen and the scan lines going down. And it tells us what operations need to be performed when. Don't forget, each cycle across the screen represents 
one pixel. So eight cycles represents one row of one tile. The PPU is only capable of storing information for the next tile it's going to render. So during those eight cycles, it's loading up the information it requires for the next eight pixels. In this case, it loads the name table byte, so that's the tile ID. Then it loads the attribute byte, that's going to contain the palette information. Then it loads the pattern itself. So remember, this was split into two planes, one representing the LSB and one representing the HISB. It knows which pattern to read because it's already read the name table byte. And it knows how to combine these into the correct color because it's read the attribute byte. Once the eight pixels have been drawn, we effectively move to the next tile. This movement is illustrated by this increase horizontal cell in the chart. And then we repeat the process and we keep doing that all the way across the screen. There's 256 pixels in the screen, so naturally it stops at that point. Even though the last eight pixels of a scan line follow the same pattern, the data is unused because there's no point in rendering beyond the scan line. And don't forget the number of cycles exceeds the number of pixels on the screen. But what we do need to prepare is the rendering system for the next row's first tile. And that happens here towards the end of the scan line. There are some additional reads of the tile ID, but they, they get ignored. You may also recall that we jump to scan line minus one at the start. Well, the whole purpose of jumping to scan line minus one, in this case, it's labeled as zero, is simply to prepare the very first pixels that are visible on the screen. So as the scan line traverses across the screen, at each tile boundary, we increment our address that's accessing the name table. When we get to the end of the visible area, we increment our address, but we increment it vertically in our name table and reset the X position. The nice thing about this timing diagram is it also includes additional information, things that we've already covered, such as when the V blank flag gets set. It also contains information about where and how the sprites are loaded, but we're not looking at that this video. When you start reading the documentation, for NES emulation, inevitably you'll come across something called Loopy. Loopy was a guy that generated quite a convenient memory structure for representing this information. It's not dissimilar to the course X and course Y with the name table bits I showed before when using it as a 12-bit address. This address is distinct to all of the other addresses we've used so far. This is an internal address maintained by the PPU that correlates the scanline position to, well, everything else that's going on. And it's almost always maintained by the PPU itself. In fact, this is the reason why you can't write to the PPU whilst it's rendering, because you would inadvertently change this address, and so the PPU would get confused with where it's reading its graphics sources from. I'm going to do things the Loopy way, so thank you very much Loopy for creating this fantastically convenient interpretation of the internals of the PPU data bus. Unsurprisingly, the NESDEV wiki promotes the use of using Loopy's approach too, and it's quite verbose in telling us when and how the Loopy registers are updated. Two registers are maintained. One is labelled V, which is the internal data register that the PPU is incrementing as required to get the data. The other one is called T, and this is the one that gets affected by the user. So when the user reads and writes to the PPU, this is the register that is updated. Periodically, parts of V need to be updated with the contents of T. Things like facilitating the reset at the end of a scan line to go back to a known location. These registers combine the scrolling information, as well as the PPU's location, in order to access the right bytes of memory. In the first episode of the series, I implied that there is no code on NESDEV. Well, the Loopy register is the only place where I have actually found some implementable pseudocode. It's written using bitwise tricks all over the place. My implementation makes this a little bit more verbose. So it is my intention now to replace the PPU address variable that I created temporarily with these Loopy registers. And looking at the internals of the register, it is very similar to how I described it before. Course X and Course Y are written to by the scroll position. The name table specifically gets a bit each. And we've also got a variable that stores our fine Y position. It's only a 15-bit register, so I'm using a 16-bit word to store it. And I'm creating two loopy registers, VRAM and TRAM. The only missing piece of information now is for fine X scrolling. The PPU address is now effectively replaced with the VRAM address. In CPU read, 
Not much interesting goes on regarding the loopy registers, except for this auto increment. CPU write, however, does have quite a lot of influence over these registers. The control register contains two bits which represent which one of the four name tables we're interested in using. I'm going to store these in the TRAM address variable. We don't directly ever write to the VRAM address, we always write to the TRAM address, so I've modified writing to the PPU address register accordingly. However, once a full 16 bits of address information has been written, the VRAM address is updated with the TRAM address. The register that causes all of this complexity is the scroll register. And again, this is written to in two halves. And each write successively flip-flops between the two halves of the address. The data written to the scroll register sets in screen space the pixel offset. So our fine x offset is between 0 and 7. It's the bottom three bits of the data. But we can also extract the coarse x location from the same byte of data. In a similar way, we can store fine y and course y. I'm now going to modify my clock function in accordance to the timing table we can get from Nesdev. We've already included two specific entries for setting the vertical blank flag. The bulk of these operations are going to apply to all of the visible scan lines. And for a bunch of cycles on a particular scan line, we want to extract the tile ID, the attribute, and the bitmap patterns. When we get to the end of a scan line, we want to increment in the y direction our loopy register. The repeated eight cycles per tile can be implemented with a switch case statement. These cycles are for preloading the PPU with the information it needs to render the next eight pixels. So I need to create some variables to store this information. In the header file, I'm going to add four variables, the background next tile ID, next attribute, and two 8-bit variables that represent the plane of the pattern memory for the next eight pixels. And recall that these are one bit per pixel. And so the first thing to do is to read the tile ID, then the attribute ID. And don't forget, that's a single byte that represents additional data split up into two bit patterns. So there's a little bit more manipulation required to actually extract the final two bit information that we need. Then I'll extract the lower significant bit plane and then the higher significant bit plane. You can see these are the same, except there is an offset of 8, as described earlier. Now I'll forgive you for looking at that and going, whoa. In the accompanying source file, I've gone to some great lengths to actually explain precisely what is happening at each one of these stages. And I break down the bitwise operations into the component parts with a description. I've already described most of this in the slides, but when you see it formalised like this, I can appreciate it is a little confusing to see on the screen. But I really want this video to be under two hours long. On the timing diagram, all of the cycles marked in red imply that we're doing some additional manipulation of the loopy registers. And there are four essential functions, incrementing in the x direction, incrementing in the y direction, resetting along the x axis and resetting along the y axis. I'm going to implement these as lambda functions in my clock function. Incrementing in the x direction simply adds 1 to the VRAM address value, but if we go beyond the edge of the name table, we flip the name table bit. So now we're indexing into the other name table. And this line will make a little bit more sense in the next episode, but effectively we can only do these things if we're rendering something. If the renderer is disabled, none of this applies. And this enabling is set by setting bits in the mask register. Incrementing in Y is pretty much the same thing, except we increment our Y address, and this is because we're operating on a scanline basis, and scanlines are one pixel high. Whereas when we're moving along in the X axis, we're reading new tile information every eight pixels. So that aligns with the coarse X value, but in Y, we need to use the fine Y value. If fine y is greater than 8 pixels, the width of a tile, then we increment the coarse y variable. And just as before, if we go beyond the name table vertically, we flip the name table bit so we can access the other name table, its corresponding counterpart of the pair. Resetting the address, I've called it transferring the address, is simply a case of copying over the x components of the tram address variable into the vram address variable. And similarly for y. Going back to our case statement, once we've gone through 8 pixels, we know we must be going on to the next tile. So we'll increment scroll x. And when we're done with a visible row, we'll increment scroll y. 
But because we've incremented scroll y, our x coordinate is still incorrect. So we need to reset it back to the start of the scanline. And we'll need to set our y components on the non visible scanline ready for a new frame. Curiously, on scanline 240, nothing happens. We're almost there now. We have the facility to know precisely which background tile we need to access, depending on which name table is in place, and how far we've scrolled across the screen. But of course right now, everything is happening in 8 pixel chunks, because we've been reading bytes from the memory. These 8 pixels need to be buffered so that they can be rendered for the next 8 cycles. We've already loaded and stored this information in these variables. But now we need to go on to a slightly parallel part of the PPU that takes this information and composites it to the correct pixel colour in the correct location. The NES utilises shift registers in order to do this. Here I have a row of 16 pixels on a single scan line. Whilst the scan line is rendering these pixels, it's loading up the information for the next 8. This information is loaded into the low byte of a 16-bit shift register. Every cycle, therefore every pixel, the shift registers shift to the right. So by the time we get to this tile boundary, the bit information for the next 8 pixels is in the high byte of the 16-bit shift register. Let's look at the pixel bit planes as an example. When I get to rendering this pixel, I can take the most significant bits of the shift registers to give me my pixel value. When I move to the next pixel, both of these registers have shifted 1. So again, I can take the most significant bits to give me the correct pixel value for that pixel. In a way, as the scan line is rolling this way, the shift registers are rolling this way. So they converge to give us the correct pixel values in the right location. However, there is something else that affects this value, and that is our fine x position we set via the scroll register. Everything so far has happened at tile boundaries, but we want pixel precision for our scrolling. So instead of choosing the most significant bit all of the time, we choose the bit chosen by the fine x register. So supposing our fine x is equal to the third bit, then instead of the most significant bit, we choose the one that is 3 in from the most significant bit. This has effectively scrolled our tile by 3 pixels. And then of course the shift register moves everything to the left and our scan line moves one to the right and we carry on as normal. The palettes were only represented as two bits but they apply to the whole row. So when we load in the palette attribute information for that particular tile I'm going to set all of the bits to be the same. That way I can use exactly the same mechanism to choose all of the information I need to get me my final pixel colour. As the scan line continues through the pixels that we're rendering, in the background we're loading up the information for the next 8 pixels. And because this is a 16-bit shift register, these all get moved along by 1 as well. So we end up with this never-ending stream of 1-bit information to give us a very smooth scroll in the x direction but also supply us with the information we need to produce the correct colour. I'm just going to use 16-bit words to represent my shifters. And to the clock function, I'm going to add another two lambda functions. One prepares the shifters for rendering. For the pixels, we load the whole 8-bit word into the bottom of the 16-bit shifter. For the palettes, we take the individual binary bit, specified here, and we inflate them to a full 8 bits. So this ensures that our palettes are in sync with our patterns. The second lambda is going to simply update the shifters. It's going to shift them all to the right by one bit. That's for the pixels and that's for the palettes. Every visible cycle we want to update the shifters. And when the internal cycle counter loops around eight pixels, we're going to load our background shifters with the next eight pixels worth of information. Now that we've got a cycle and scanline tracking architecture and we know which pixel we're at and we know what palette it is and which bitmap it's using, it's time to composite it all and draw it. And this will seem relatively simple given everything we've seen so far. I only want to draw the background if we've enabled drawing backgrounds in the mask register. I need to select which bit of the shift register depending upon my fine x value. At the moment, by default, it's set to choose the most significant bit. 
and I'll shift that depending on the value of fine x. Once that bit has been moved, I can use it to extract a particular bit in my shifters. I'm going to do that for both pixel planes here, and I'll combine those pixel planes into a two-bit word that represents the pixel, and see how we're getting things going back to the start of the video now. In exactly the same way, I'm going to get the two-bit information for my palette. This means where we were just generating noise before, I can use my get color from palette RAM and pass in the palette and pixel we've just created, and it seems like a long time ago now we defined that function, to actually choose the final color to draw on the screen. So let's take a look. Start the emulation, and now we can see Donkey Kong rendered with the correct colors this time. So before it was rendered with a whole palette, but now it's choosing the palette depending on the attribute regions of the final output. And we can see Donkey Kong very happily doing, well, he's just having a dance at the moment, there's nothing else to really do up there. It's interesting that he was part of the background. Super Mario Bros. kind of works. There's a reason why it doesn't, and we'll see a lot more of that in the next video. At this stage, it's difficult to find titles that support scrolling, because we've only implemented Mapper Zero, which is a very simple one. So most of those games were fixed single screens. And as we've just seen with Super Mario, that's relying on a few other features before it'll start to scroll the demo at the beginning. But this one's quite nice, so here we can see vertical scrolling being used very smoothly indeed. Interestingly, as it's playing out the demo, we can see parts of the name table in the background disappearing. This will have been the uh, ice climber chipping away at the blocks above him. And here's good old Kung Fu. I'm kind of glad that one's not working. It's a terrible game. So this has been a long and complicated video, and it is by far the longest and most complicated video of this series. Uh, the remaining videos, next week we're going to look at sprites, and then after that we'll be looking at sound, uh, should be considerably simpler than this. If you've enjoyed this one, please give me a big thumbs up and have a think about subscribing. Thanks again to all of my Patreons and people who have joined the YouTube channel. We're getting to a really exciting number of subscribers now. I never would have thought that. Um, always come and have a chat on the Discord server if you've got some questions. The source code's going to be available on the GitHub. And I'll see you next time. Take care.